With that, uh, I recognize the full committee chairman, Mr. Issa of California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this important hearing. Uh, Dr. Biggs, uh, we have uh, a constant debate, it seems, on public and private sector uh, activities, union, non-union. The ranking member uh, went on quite a bit, uh, acting as though it is uh, scapegoats. Don't we have basically a difference between unionized private sector workers and public workers, particularly in that in the private sector a unionized worker is in Social Security, while in the public sector at all the State levels, virtually, they are in a system that, that has their high pay opted out of Social Security and often Medicare, which means they are out of a system and into their own system. Uh, which is not fully paid for, and uh, as I think Dr. Baker made very clear, they have this safety net, which is current overseers, the elected officials and or their representatives, can make a deal that ultimately they know cannot be kept in the future without unrealistic expectations of growth in their and their bonds. Typically in California, they were assuming a growth that you could not find in any index but you could find it for a short time in PERS and STRS. Would you like to give us a little insight into that part of, of the problem we are dealing with on these pensions? Well, this, I think, is an important issue, because one question of how you resolve some of these, these pension financing issues comes down to your, your perceptions of, of how well or how poorly paid public sector employees are. You are right that many public sector employees don't participate in Social Security, and that is sometimes pointed out as if they are they're losing something in that regard. And I don't want to downplay the important protections that Social Security provides, but as a general deal, public sector pensions are a far better deal for them. Uh, Social Security would pay them, on average, a rate of return around 2 percent of their contributions. Um, under the typical public sector pension, they are effectively guaranteed a rate of return of around 8 percent. Compound that over your full career, and it is an enormous difference. You also tend to get in the in the the state and local sector retiree health care, which can be very generous, and often that's not included in in the private sector. Uh, uh, Congressman Cummings was just mentioning uh, employees in Wisconsin. I know uh, Milwaukee teachers, for instance, receive retiree health care that's worth around 20 percent of their pay. The sort of pay studies we've heard about today, saying that uh, state and local employees are underpaid, it doesn't include retiree health care. It also tends to undercount the the pension benefits they get. So we want to get a good feel for where things stand. We, we have to compete for workers with the private sector if you are in, in any lo lo level of government. You don't want to underpay people, but it, it, you, it takes careful analysis to, to be able to tell whether they are being fairly paid or not. One, I guess to, to touch on your, your last point, the, the, the assumptions that go in, into the, the pension financing, things like this, I have focused on the assumed rate of return, and that is the most important one. There are many other things that can be jimmied around. Illinois had some problems where they would cut benefits for workers that haven't even been hired yet and book those savings today. Um, there's been examples in Washington State where their actuary said, you have to better account for the longer work lives of people, and the, and the board said, no, we're not going to do it. Well, uh, and I'm going to cut you off. I apologize. It, but you're, it's a good train of thought, and certainly in San Diego we have a scandal where that, that has been well codified in, in criminal prosecutions. Dr. Baker, I, I saw you startled when I, when I talked about the unrealistic expectations of the growth in PERS and STRS and so on. Now, I, I heard you say earlier with the ranking member that, well, the markets have come back. But isn't it true that if you were broadly invested, you, in fact, over the last three years had effectively net zero? And net zero is 24 percent compounded less than the anticipated amount that these, these contributions were based on. Can you sit here today saying that anyone on this side of the aisle should have confidence in these uh, retirement plans if they assume 8 percent growth rather than, uh, let's just say, inflation plus 1 or 2? I don't think there has been anyone who has been more critical of overly optimistic returns in the stock market than I am, and I base that on price to earnings ratios. They were very high in the 90s. They were still somewhat high in the last decade. They have fallen a great deal. Future returns depend on current price-to-earnings ratios. Now that the price-to-earnings ratio is considerably lower, if you look out over a 20, 30-year horizon, then yes, I could look to your side of the aisle and say, yes, I think those returns are very reasonable, and I have done the arithmetic. Okay. Well, uh, I, I hope you are right. Uh, 
let's, uh, let's do another half of this. Dr. Biggs, back to you for a second. Uh, we have historically low interest rates today. We have a huge ballooning Federal deficit, but my own State of California and many others have built up a lot of debt. What happens if we return to, if you will, somewhere between where we are today and where we were in the 70s? What happens to both the Federal and the State's ability to meet pension obligations? We have uh, the Federal budget and, uh, to a degree, State budgets have benefited uh, from the fact that our uh, financing crisis, our budget problems have coincided with, with significant financial problems overseas, which has pushed capital from, from foreign countries into the U.S., and that has helped keep our interest rates low. So we have been very sort of advantaged by virtue of that. If interest rates start rising back to normal levels or if they go even further, uh, if, if markets are not convinced of our ability to get on top of our deficits, then all of this, the, the, this process starts cascading and it happens much, much sooner than we would otherwise uh, anticipate. The, the history of financial crises, whether you are talking about currency crises, uh, crises, banking crises, is they can continue going on normal, but when they happen, they happen very, very quickly. So I think it is very good and we are very lucky to have low interest rates today. We should not be complacent because of that. Thank you. Yield back. 